Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Andrea Lamoureux, and I want to welcome you to our Explore Lakes with New Hampshire Lakes webinar series. Tonight, you're tuning in for the Secret Life in Lakes, and we've got a, a great uh, fun evening planned with some experts. So we'll get to the, the presentation momentarily. But I just want to do a little bit of meeting management. Um, I see a lot of friendly faces out there. Um, thanks for, for joining us this evening. You know the drill. For those of you who are new, welcome. And just a little bit of housekeeping to keep us on um, a, a quick and efficient meeting. Um, this session is being recorded. Um, so if you want to watch it again or share it with your friends and family, you will have a link sent to you tomorrow. Uh, participants, please, the attendees, please stay on mute for the duration of the webinar so that um, we can hear our experts loud and clear and not hear your dogs and cats running around in the background. You are welcome to leave your camera on. If you do leave your camera on, just remember that other people can see you and they might get jealous if you're drinking that second or third glass of wine. Um, if you are having bandwidth problems, sometimes um, the experts tell me if you turn off your video, um, you might get a little bit better reception. So um, little for those of you, but by this time we're probably all Zoom experts, but if you're not a Zoom expert, just a very quick tutorial if you want to change your display name so we know who you are, but I actually am looking through this and I see um, what looks like real names. I don't see like dad's iPad or anything like that. So awesome, we know who's here and um, that helps us and our moderators know who's asking questions. So during the presentation, please feel free to uh, find the chat box and type your questions into the chat box and our expert chat box team from New Hampshire Lakes would do their best to answer your questions as the presentations um, go hopping along, but those tricky hard questions, they will save those questions for our experts at the end in the Q&A. Tomorrow you will receive, as I mentioned, um, a email with links to this presentation, the slides and the recording. You will also receive an evaluation tomorrow. For those of you who have been with us, you know that evaluation usually comes um, right after the presentation, but we've changed the, our platform. So you will receive an evaluation tomorrow. Please do take the time to fill it out and let us know how we did, what you liked, what we could have done better and things you wanna hear about in the future. So your host this evening, um, joining me is Crystal Costa Balanoff, our conservation program coordinator, and Jessica Sayers, our conservation program assistant. Um, and we also have Soren Denlinger in the house. He's also on our team and he's uh, maybe helping out here and there as he is very good at finding information as well. We have a couple board members on the call today and, and apologies if I don't get to everyone, but Bob Shaw, welcome. I know you've been a, a very good uh, regular to these. So thank you for tuning in. So for those of you who are new to us, New Hampshire Lakes, we are the only member supported nonprofit organization working to keep all of New Hampshire's lakes clean and healthy, all 1000 of them. And I know I have, we have many members here in the house tonight. Thank you so much for your support over the years. We couldn't do this important work uh, without you on our team. And for those of you who are new to us, I do encourage you to go to our website and learn more about us, nhlakes.org, and feel free to um, join us. Our mission, simply put, is just to keep our lakes and ponds clean and healthy now and in the future. And we help to inspire people uh, to take care of our lakes. And we do that in a number of ways. We have a couple flagship programs. If you know us, if you're new to us and you know us, you may know us through our Lake Host Courtesy Boat Inspection Program. We're going on our 20th summer this year, inspecting boats at, throughout the state, helping boaters keep our lakes free and clear from invasive species. We have recently launched a Lake Friendly Living Program, the Lake Smart Program, and I see a, a number of Lake Smart uh, Program participants in the audience tonight. Thank you. We also do very important work at the state capitol relative to advocacy in the state legislature, helping to um, craft rules and laws and weigh in on policies that um, 
you know, will affect how our lakes are managed. And we do outreach and in normally in the normal times we love getting out in the community and meeting with people and family and friends and doing hands on activities to inspire the next generation of lake stewards but we haven't been able to do a whole lot of that the past month. But instead we've found that webinars um, spending evenings like this with folks like you are a really great um, way to do outreach and to come together as a, a community. So. Um, we have lined up our spring series of webinars and these are all posted on our website where you can register and um, then after May and June throughout the summer we'll have uh, every other week webinars during the summer so more to come on that. But without any further ado I would love to turn this over to our experts um, some very talented expert folks to spend the next hour with you. Amanda Murby McQuaid, uh, Sarah Steiner and Amy Smagula. They're all from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and turn it over to Amanda. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. See my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, New Hampshire Lakes, for having us tonight. We're really excited because this is a topic that is, is hard to cover, the, the secret life of lakes. Um, Amy, Sarah, and I will, will um, try to get through a lot of topics, but just barely touching the surface of all the cool things that we think um, are interesting in lakes and, and a lot of things that you might have questions about. Um, we are uh, limnologists with New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, a limnologist is a lake biologist. Um, so we each have our own expertise um, at New Hampshire DES, but um, we largely cover a lot of these um, fun, cool critters and uh, algae and plants that you see in lakes. Um, and that's what we want to talk to you tonight about. So on the agenda, um, we're going to split it up into these three categories. I'll start in the microscopic world. Um, then Sarah will cover the closer to the bottom of the lakes. And then Amy will cover underwater and attached um, organisms and things. And um, so to bring up that word limnologist again. So limnology is the study of lakes. And there are a lot of different um, sciences in limnology. It's physical, it's chemical, it's biological. Um, so today we want to just kind of show you a few of the things we find interesting. So um, to start, I'm going to talk about the microscopic world. And um, this is largely the suspended stuff that you see in the water column, or you might not see. Um, maybe you don't even realize that is next to you while you're swimming. Um, but this is the microscopic lake life lake life that you will find floating, swimming, sinking, gliding, all these interesting things in the lake. Um, so, you know, plankton is loosely defined as microscopic organisms and particles drifting or floating in the sea or freshwater. Um, so in freshwater, if you um, were to send a net down into the lake, as we have in this picture to the left, um, these plankton nets, this is from the, an image from the Center for Freshwater Biology at UNH. Um, a lot of the images I'll share today are from either DES or UNH uh, Center for Freshwater Biology. Um, but these nets um, that you can see here on the left are lowered into the water column and there's a fine mesh on them. And this is something that limnologists use in their studies to um, look at what's in the water, what, what sort of organisms are living in the lake water. And these um, organisms, plankton, are largely made up of little tiny plants and animals. And they can tell us a lot about the health of a lake and the food web dynamics of a system. So these are just a few of the pretty organisms that you might see in a lake. And I'll cover a few of these categories today. 
Um, but what we also find is in this research, we can also look for invasive species or find that there might be um, a shift in dominance to an organism that indicates that there's poor water quality. So um, studying plankton is, is really important in limnology. And I have to again point to the UNH um, Center for Freshwater Biology. Um, at their website, they do provide several um, lay person citizen keys that people use on um, regularly um, to learn more about like the whole range of different types of phytoplankton and zooplankton and other organisms that live in water. And in phytoplankton, there is just so much diversity. Just think of all the different plants there are in the world. There are just as many microscopic plants or photosynthetic bacteria, including cyanobacteria, um, which I'll also talk a lot about tonight. Um, and what scientists do is they look at the combination of these types of organisms in water to classify them. And in lakes, we do have this classification system where um, we kind of rank lakes based on a lot of factors, but some of those include how much phytoplankton is in the water or how much chlorophyll or how clear the water is. Those are all related to how much phytoplankton is in the water. And so eutrophic systems tend to have more phytoplankton. Mesotrophic is sort of the mid range and then oligotrophic have fewer phytoplankton. Um, but this dynamic changes seasonally. There's a lot of different dynamics that change the presence of these organisms in a system. And a, what a lot of researchers are now looking at more specifically is how climate is affecting our waters and how is it shifting to some of these other phytoplankton that do better in really warm nutrient rich waters. And so a lot of these factors that should determine what we even see in the water um, are really add up to a lot of factors, um, temperature, water stratification, pH, um, rainfall and extreme weather events, and um, mostly relying on nutrients, both macronutrients and micronutrients. So there's just a lot of factors that go into the presence of these little tiny plants and bacteria in our water. <clears throat> Excuse me. So have to talk about cyanobacteria. So I, I run the Harmful Algal and Cyanobacteria Bloom Program, the DES, as well as the Beach Inspection Program. Um, we do get a lot of calls about things that just don't look right on lakes. Sometimes the water has turned a little bit green and that's largely due to a bloom of algae, but mostly cyanobacteria is what we're concerned about. Um, the cyanobacteria are photosynthetic bacteria um, but the reason why we're concerned about them is that they have the potential to produce toxins called cyanotoxins. And there are a lot of different types of toxins that these many different types of organisms can produce. Not all of the cyanobacteria are toxic, but again, there's just such a wide range of different types that can cause um, illness. Uh, toxins can cause skin irritations, um, upset stomach like gastroenteritis, it can cause seizures, and it's also been attributed to causing some chronic illness and even death. So we are very concerned when lakes sort of become more dominant with the cyanobacteria because of their potential toxicity. And that's why we have now a program dedicated to investigating into more um, reasons to look into why we're having more blooms and how to protect our watersheds. So um, I'd like you just to take a minute to just like look this over a bit because this is just from like one or two summers of just different types of cyanobacteria related blooms that we see. It's not always this blue green scum that you might see on the surface of lakes or at the beach or just sort of isolated in little corners. Um, it can look a, a, like a lot of different colors actually. Um, the water itself can just be a hue of green. There's no actual scum or slick to it, um, but we see like orangey, yellow colored blooms. Um, we have these like blue green flecks. Um, sometimes the water looks like cloudy, milky. Um, that's usually when a bloom dies, it begins to kind of fade and look more white. 
Um, we, we see these like blue green marbles at the bottom of the lake sometimes. Those are also a type of cyanobacteria. Um, this last summer we had um, a black benthic mat pop up at a few of our lakes. Um, and that's a benthic mat of cyanobacteria. Um, I also have this photo here of just like little tiny red dots. And I just wanna mention that there's also this group of cyanobacteria called PICO cyanobacteria, and they're very tiny and you need to use special lights to see them. They're too tiny to even capture in a plankton net. So all of this, there's just a great range and variety of cyanobacteria. And we often at DES get calls when people see something that just doesn't look right. It, you know, the water's usually clear and today it looks orange. Um, and in that top right corner, that orange blob was just the biggest mystery for me of the summer. Um, it turns out that that was also cyanobacteria sort of molded together with this other type of green algae. And I have that next to it, the microscopic photo of what that contained. It's a cyanobacteria called Warnachinia and a green algae called Botryococcus. And they're both kind of sticky and waxy. So even those together created this orange blob. So there are a lot of interesting things that we see on lakes. Some of the more unique types of cyanobacteria that also just don't create that surface scum look very different um, at the surface. And then as you go deeper into the microscopic view, you can really see what they're made of. Um, so for example, the gliotrichia at the top there, this is an organism, cyanobacteria that we do see in some of our cleanest lakes, they're, they're often in Lake Winnipesaukee and Lake Sunapee. Um, they're not that toxic. They are known to produce some toxins, but um, they're uh, one that just is not very typical that you wouldn't really expect to be a bloom, but they look like just tiny little dots in the water. Um, as you get closer, they look a little fuzzy and then you can see their actual cell structure. Again, nostoc are those like blue green marbles you might see. You might think oh, that's strange and I don't know what that is or you wanna play with it, but you just wanna be careful not to consume these things. And so it's good to try to keep dogs and children away from them. Um, but they're very fascinating organisms in, in themselves. If you cut into that ball and look at it under the microscope, you can see all of these really tightly coiled kinks of cells. And then finally, that black benthic mat, we're finding at a lot of the lakes, um, when we see the black mat, it's of a group called Stygonematales. And we did see that in Lake Winnipesaukee and Spofford Lake um, this last summer. And so, you know, aside from the blue-green scums, there's just a great variety of different types that you might see in lakes. And we really encourage you to um, contact us if you do see anything anomalous. And so I just wanna kind of shift this to a, a food chain story that is not lake related and I apologize, but it makes you think about our exposure to cyanobacteria and their toxins. So the toxin exposure that we're concerned about with, at DES is mostly recreational and drinking. Um, we, we wanna make sure that people are aware of the potential toxicity of cyanobacteria at the beach for contact. Um, for drinking. We don't want to make sure that our public water systems are not um, having lots of cyanobacteria growing in them. Um, we're worried about exposure through dermal contact. Um, some people are more sensitive than others, but it can cause um, some serious rashes or lesions. Um, there's new studies looking at inhalation. Um, so just like a, a red tide event in say like Florida, if there's a red tide event, um, the inhalation of toxins is a concern and they'll actually try to get people away from the beach if that's the case. We don't necessarily have that going on here, but it's just another avenue of, of consideration of um, our exposure. And there actually is a lot of research being done at the University of New Hampshire and Dartmouth with um, inhalation studies and aeration. Um, but finally, on this slide, you're probably looking at it like, what are you talking about? I wanted to bring up this story, this food web story, because it really is fascinating and it sort of set the stage for several research projects across the world. And basically this is 
you know, a very unique food web. It's not something that you it's you know you would necessarily be exposed to here, but it makes you think about other food webs. What are the food webs that we have in New Hampshire that would be a potential exposure? And this is just um, a wide wide expanding science, really. So. Um, so anyway, I'll start with the pictures. So at the top left here is the cycad tree. And this is on the island of Guam. And the cycad tree at the base of the tree has these fleshy white roots that pop up and get sunlight. And within that root, there is like a green band. And what they found, researchers found that there were these tiny kinks of nostoc cyanobacteria, like those blue green marbles that we see in New Hampshire those nostoc rings were symbiotically surviving in the roots of the cycad tree and were toxic for a toxin um, that's called BMAA and it's a neurotoxin. Um, researchers found that that toxin biomagnified up to the fruit of the cycad. So at the top of the tree where the, where the cycad fruits lie, those had even higher level of toxin than the root of the tree where the cyanobacteria were living. Then along came the flying fox, the bat to the right there. Con consuming the um, fruit of the cycad, they found that that bat itself then had a much higher load of toxin from consuming the fruit. And so there was a biomagnification effect occurring in this food web. So how did it reach people? Well, researchers found that um, the Chamorro tribesmen in Guam had a much higher incident rate of having neurodegenerative disease or ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And so looking at this unique food web, they found that the Chamorro tribesmen actually consumed the entire fruit fat, fruit bat in flour broth from the cycad, excuse me, and um, they eat the entire thing that had the wings and all, and then the Chamorro tribesmen were getting a higher load of toxin. So again, that's a very unique food web, but the, the key element to this story is that we don't really have a full understanding of cyanotoxin exposure, especially through food webs. This collage is, is by JF, uh, Jim Haney with UNH, he was my advisor. Um, I also did a lot of research on food web dynamics um, in lakes. I won't bore you with that now, but you can contact me later if you have more questions about that. So, you know, coming back down to reality, what do we do in New Hampshire? When we see a bloom, we would really like you to call us and report what you're seeing, even if it's not a bloom. If it, the water looks like it's changed colors, it looks scummy, you're just not sure. We really want to document these better. First, avoid contact and definitely keep your pets and children out of the water. Not all blooms are toxic, but we just can't um, be sure at the time when we see them. Take a photo and record your location and then just call me, you know, basically just send me the photo or email me and, and we'll um, go through the steps of figuring out what you have going on there. So that was a lot of time on cyanobacteria, but again, that's just sort of the um, my interest, and, and there's a lot of scums that are not cyanobacteria. And um, I don't know if, if you notice on the Nashua River this summer, Wolfia, um, this tiny little flowering plant uh, is also called water meal. It just covered the Nashua River and other rivers, but um, it was very noticeable from like the highway. Um, we got a lot of calls about it. So it's not harmful. It might look kind of unsightly, perhaps. Um, but it was a big year for Wolfia. Um, sometimes we also have Euglena blooms, so they do look just like cyanobacteria. Um, we're just starting to see more of these in recent years, so it'd be interesting to keep track of Euglena. They're just these like sort of plant animal combination organisms on the bottom left there. Um, this organism has this red eye spot that helps it kind of move around, but the slick that it creates is from when it, it um, reproduces very rapidly and all of the eggs and these organisms sort of look like a, a scum. Um, and then finally, the, the big one is green filamentous algae. Um, people are always falling, fall, like finding these big clouds of like cotton candy, like 
um, algae and they're, they're sort of submerged below the water often. But if you try the stick test, so if you take a stick and you just try to lift it up, if it looks like it's all kind of coming together like a hairy, slimy mass, it's probably green filamentous algae and not cyanobacteria. But still, please give us a call if you see anything that's kind of weird, unsightly, kind of gross. And so I'm gonna just switch it over to the other side of the plankton world, kind of covered the plants. Now looking at some of the animals are, are really exciting as well. Um, again, I, I've done a lot of food web, food web research on zooplankton. These are microscopic animals. And there's just such a great variety of these animals in lakes. And you just would never know that you're swimming next to them. So on the left-hand side, this is from, again, the CFB um, with UNH, the zooplankton key, which is the oldest of the keys. Um, they kind of go through these different categories of zooplankton. I won't get into all the details here, but the, they're grouped by, based on their um, structures and their behavior and their taxonomy, of course. And so this key really helps you kind of identify these organisms if you ever go out and look yourself. Um, there's Cladocera, there's Copepoda, uh, Rotifera, and then other arthropods like the um, Chaobrus, which is that bottom right hand photo there. Um, Chaobrus are a midge larva that live basically their whole lives in lakes. And they, they come up and down in the lake um, around twilight um, when the sunset goes down. They come up to feed, but then try to avoid being fed on by fish. So they're a very integral part in the food web of lakes. And this picture is from some of the research at UNH. Um, this Chaobrus is kind of stuck in a bloom of anabina. And um, we're looking at the food web dynamics of toxin transfer to some of these types of, of animals that feed the rest of the lake. These are sort of, you know, the bottom of the food chain, basically, in lakes, these different organisms. And so <clears throat> I have to just focus on Daphnia for a few minutes. Um, Daphnia are like the poster child of zooplankton. Um, you might have also heard the term water flea sort of a water flea. Um, but these are like grazers in the lakes. They help remove phytoplankton from the waters. So they're kind of like, you know, little cows in the lake, you know, grooming the lake to make sure that they're eating all the good stuff out of there and, you know, helps keep a good balance in the system. Um, these Daphnia are zooplankton. They're also arthropods. So they're classified because they have segmented appendages, segmented body, just like bees or other um, insects do. And they're also called cladocerans and they have this clear carapace around their body. So this is just what they look like when you look at them under the microscope. Um, there's no dissecting needed. You just look right through them and you can see everything. Um, and they're identified by these structures here. Um, so uh, on the back side, you can see its brood chamber with the developing eggs. Um, so they go through a process called parthenogenesis for, for most of the time, um, which is basically they clone themselves. And so they're very efficient at reproducing that way. Um, but again, they have just a really integral um, piece in the food web network of lakes. So this is a video by Dr. Jim Haney. Um, we did some uh, videos of just kind of seeing what they would do when they're trying to feed on different organisms. And so what it does is it takes its claw and does something called a post-abdominal rejection. And so basically it can regulate its food intake by kicking it out. And what we're finding is that they tend to kick out the large types of cyanobacteria more often than other algae. So they have a nice, efficient way of sort of controlling the food that comes into their body, and they're able to kick out that big toxic um, colony. And so sometimes these Daphnia sort of go through a stressful period. This might be um, in the fall when the lakes are turning over and it's getting really cold. And so another kind of strange thing that you might see 
on the shore and the water, uh, these little tiny black little specks in the water. These photos by Kevin Kelly from Lake Kanesaka um, ha just happened this last fall. And these are just little resting eggs from Daphnia. So remember I said Daphnia go through parthenogenesis, they clone themselves. Well, they also can sexually reproduce and then they create these resting eggs. So then the eggs, um, you can't really see them. They're encapsulated into this black backpack on this Daphnia. And then they will release that because they're hoping for better days to come. There's like, conditions aren't great right now. We're gonna have to reproduce. They're gonna drop all their eggs and hope for a better day in the future. Um, so you might see these black little specks. Um, and with that, you know, we found that these were all over this lake foam. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to also mention a lake foam is also um, a product that you'll see with all these anomalous things. Um, but lake foam is really natural. It's, it's really just a product of natural degradation of um, organic material in the lakes. It breaks the surface tension of the lake and sort of creates what we call a surfactant. So it, it just becomes kind of a foamy mess basically on the shoreline. Um, I will just add though, if you approach these black specks and they jump, um, they're not diapause eggs, they're probably springtails. Um, one of my best friends just reminded me of this the other day. She shared a video and um, we're already starting to see springtails on the snow and along lakes and around the ice. So if you see something like this and you approach it and they all kind of jump away, it, that might be a totally different thing. Um, but in this case, this was a, a diapause ephippia, we call it. And so it always ends with scum, with stuff that I talk about here. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll uh, send this over to Sarah and just bear with us as we switch controls here. Okay, can everyone hear me? I hope so. Great. So Good evening, everyone. So it's time for me to take you um, to the lake bottom and show you some of the lesser seen organisms that occupy the benthic zone. So these organisms live in or near the sediments. Most of them are macroscopic, meaning you can see them with the naked eye, but you don't often notice them, or you might only notice them when they emerge from, and into their adult forms. Oftentimes they look creepy or maybe a little slimy, but they play a very important role in decomposition and in the aquatic food web. All right, so what lives down there? Mainly we're talking about macroinvertebrates and macroinvertebrates have no backbone, but you can see them with the naked eye. Again, the most common being aquatic insects and the largest being crayfish. However, many that can be quite small and barely noticeable. So they live in water for all or part of their life cycle and their survival can be related to water quality. That means that they can be sensitive or tolerant to pollution and we can often use their presence or absence as indicators of good or poor water quality. So some of the most interesting and well-known aquatic insects are ones we're, we're familiar with as adults. So dragonflies and damselflies. Like I said, we're mainly familiar with them in their adult form, flying or swarming near the water, but did you actually know they spend up to three years of their life cycle in the water after the eggs hatch? And also in temperate climates, such as we have in New Hampshire, the nymphs stop growing in winter, actually as a form of hibernation. They resume growth in the spring, and some uh, scientists have found them to be up to six years old in the water. So another interesting feature um, of dragonflies and damselfly nymphs is that in order to breathe oxygen in the water, they have gills. However, the dragonfly gills are located internally, while damselfly gills are located externally. When ready to hatch, the nymphs crawl out of the water, shed their skin, and fly away. But sometimes you'll find these molts attached to docks or emergent stems of aquatic plants. As adults, the dragonflies can live up to several months before mating and laying eggs. However, the damselflies only live about two weeks as adults. 
And both of these creatures are actually quite favorite for kids to check out at our educational events. And then an interesting fact about dragonflies is that in China, the nymphs are actually harvested for food where they're served deep fried. So next we'll talk about some mayflies. So the mayflies are some of my favorites um, because of the way they swim through the water, but also some of their more delicate features. However, they're less commonly noticed macroinvertebrate, but usually very abundant in unpolluted waters. The adults are an important food source, particularly for trout. The mayfly larvae live up to two years in the water. They feed on detritus and other plant materials and are not predators like dragonflies and damselflies. They also have gills to breathe oxygen. And when they transform into adults by floating to the surface of the water and shedding their skin, then they actually use the shed skin as a raft to float on, to let their wings dry. The adults generally live only 48 hours, which is a very short period to mate and lay eggs before they die. So they've developed synchronicity and hatching for this reason. You'll see swarms of mayflies on the water surface mating and laying eggs. The eggs will fall to the bottom of the lake or stream, and then the adults die and fall on the water surface, which usually sparks a fish feeding frenzy. Onto the larger side of things are the dobson flies. So one of the largest aquatic insects, the dobson fly larva, live one to three years in the water after the eggs hatch. These larvae are called helgramites, and the helgramites certainly live up to their name and are some of the top predators in the aquatic invertebrate world. They're a little scarier, these are the scarier creatures at educational events as they're a bit intimidating looking, more centipede-like in their movement, and you can see their pincers at the end there, um, and even though they won't bite you if you pick one up, so don't be afraid to pick them up. Uh, the long spikes protruding from the sides are called lateral filaments, and those are used for protection. They also have gills to breathe oxygen. Once the larvae mature, the helgramites actually leave the water and find a moist place to pupate, which can take 17, 7 to 14 days before the adults emerge. The adults are large, as you can see at the upper photo there, and the males have very large mandibles. However, the male mandibles are incapable of inflicting a painful bite. But the female mandibles are much smaller and it can actually draw blood. Um, Dobson flies also display synchronicity and hatching with males living up to three years, while the females live up to 10 days. Next up are stoneflies. So stoneflies live up to four years in mainly unpolluted waters. So they're like really high oxygen levels. The nymphs go through several stages of development and initially they feed on plants and detritus, but as they mature, they become predators and they'll feed on other aquatic invertebrates. They also have external gills to breathe oxygen and they prefer flowing waters with high oxygen levels or cold water in cold ponds. When they need more oxygen, you can actually see them doing push-ups to move water across their gills. When the nymphs emerge from water and shed their skin to become adults, they have very well-developed wings, but are poor flyers. So they stick pretty close to where they emerge from. They'll settle on vegetation near the water and the adults will live one to four weeks. The males will actually attract females for mating by drumming or tapping on surfaces. So another fun one are the caddis flies. Um, these are very popular at our educational events, but also one of our favorites as well. So caddisfly larvae live six months to two years in the water. They could be herbivorous, carnivorous, or omnivorous, depending upon the species present, but um, some species will actually are actually free living, while others spin these webs to collect food. So as the water flows by, the webs will collect the food, or they'll use these webs for protection. They can also build the case cases to live in, as you can see on these slides. And the cases are made by gluing the pebbles, sticks, leaves, or other debris on the bottom together with silk. The caddisflies are the, well, as I said before, they're a favorite educational events. Um, so when the kids pick up the little cases, they have no idea there's something in there. And then all of a sudden this little head pops out. Um, so it's pretty fun to, 
to let them crawl around on your hands. Um, so as the larvae grow, the cases enlarge with them, um, and before their final molt, the larva will pupate inside the case by closing both ends. They'll leave little holes at either end to allow oxygen through. Um, so then this case actually becomes a cocoon, and after two to three weeks, the pupa exit the cocoon as adults. Um, once again, the emergence is synchronized and the adults will swarm, um, and they're also a favorite food for fish. As you can see up on, on the upper right hand corner here, there's a French artist, and I'm going to murder his name, but um, called Hubert Duprat, um, and he removes caddisfly larvae from their natural environment and puts them in an aquarium. Then what he does is he provides them with beads and pearls and gold and other materials that the larvae then use to make their cases, which turn out to be pretty beautiful pieces of jewelry and artwork. And if you thought helgramites were scary, let's talk about some of the more menacing macroinvertebrates that include the predaceous diving beetle, the name says it all, and the water scorpion. So predaceous diving beetles, they live their larval stage in the water, but they live their pupal stage on land. And as adults, they actually return to water. The larvae are called water tigers. Um, so they are pretty voracious predators as well. They feed on snails and fish fry, tadpoles and leeches, um, and also mosquito larvae. So they can actually be a good control mechanism if they're present to reduce mosquito populations. They kill their prey by grabbing it with pincers, and then they actually inject a brown digestive juice to aid in digestion. I know that sounds really um, pleasant. I hope you're not eating dinner. Um, the larvae have spiracles um, that they actually place at the air-water interface that allows them to breathe oxygen. Um, adults can live up to three years, and though while many adults actually don't fly, there are some that can fly at night to other ponds when resources are scarce. And some of them are actually edible. Water scorpions, well, water, water scorpions live their entire life in the water. Um, and they undergo something called incomplete metamorphosis. The nymphs and adults look very much the same and they both live in aquatic habitats. So they have these long mantis-like front legs and then a short beak to stab their prey with. Just a note, the beak can also puncture human skin. So just watch out for these guys. Um, so they also inject their prey with tranquilizers and tenderizers to aid in digestion. Um, they also have a spiracle at the end um, with which they can use to breathe oxygen. Uh, if you're interested in their predatory behavior, there are actually a lot of videos on YouTube, um, so you can check those out. Aquatic worms and worm-like creatures, not my favorite, um, and they're not so glamorous part of aquatic biology. Uh, however, the aquatic worms play a really important role in our lakes. Um, so they have segmented bodies like earthworms. Uh, they live in the upper centimeters of fine sediment, feeding on bacteria, protozoa, fungi, and other dead organic matter. But their behavior actually mixes and aerates the sediment and provides oxygen for other organisms. They're able to absorb oxygen over their entire body, which allows them to live in oxygen poor environments. Some have hemoglobin in their blood to help transport oxygen, which turns them a really bright red color, as you can see here. They can grow back body parts if they get cut off. Um, they live a few weeks up to a few years and spend their whole life in the water. The interesting thing about this is the presence of a large number of aquatic worms and the absence of macroinvertebrates typically is indicative of polluted waters. The tube effects worms, which are pictured here, are often associated with sewage lagoons and can clog the sewage systems. So this occurred at the Rochester Wastewater Treatment Facility a couple of years ago. And so we got these samples in from them saying, you know, what are these things? Um, and needless to say, um, sewage lagoon samples are not the most pleasant thing. Uh, let's see. Ah, flatworms. These guys are cool. The planarians. Let's play this. All right, so the planarians have a flattened body. Ah. 
They have triangular heads with two eye spots, as you can see here. Um, however, their bodies are not segmented like aquatic worms. They're predators that often eat soft-bodied invertebrates and mostly live on rocks. Like the aquatic worm, they are tolerant to polluted environments with low oxygen levels. Planarians are pretty cool because they regenerate body parts very quickly and are currently used in a lot of research to study regeneration. So as you can see here, there are several YouTube videos that show how quickly this process occurs. The video here shows the tail end of a planaria after amputation, and you can already see the head beginning to regenerate. And after seven days, it's fully formed. I'm trying to move on here. Here we go. All right, now we're back on track. So horsehair worms, um, we also call these Gordian worms. Uh, the term horsehair actually came about as people thought their horses' hairs would fall into the water troughs and spontaneously come to life. And all the, though they look like worms, they're really not. Uh, they're actually parasites and they develop in the host bodies of grasshoppers, crickets, cockroaches, and some beetles. So they digest host tissue and they, then they emerge as adults. The adults actually need water to survive. The interesting thing about the adults is that they actually don't feed. So they live their adult life in water, but they don't eat anything and they can live for up to 15 months. They're not parasitic to humans, pets, or livestock. We often get calls about the horsehair worms um, and people really like to drop samples off of these guys. So there are some summers where we end up with just these jars of horsehair worms everywhere. Um, so it's, it's kind of like walking into a really creepy lab with things moving around um, in jars. It's a little scary. And this video isn't playing, which isn't a big deal. No, oh, there it is. Um, but you can see this is a jumble of horsehair worms here, um, probably looking for water. Um, it doesn't go on that long. And last but not least, I'll touch briefly on leeches and then, leeches and then hand things over to Amy. Um, so I know we're probably all familiar with leeches. Um, and who can forget that scene in Stand By Me? Probably no one scarring for life. Um, and yes, while they do, they are blood sucking predators that normally feed on fish and turtles, snails and other aquatic insects. They're an important part of, they're an important source of food for many aquatic organisms. So a really important part of the food web. And while they're predatory, they don't actually prefer the blood of warm blooded animals, including humans. Um, and in New Hampshire, there's only one species that's known to really regularly attach to humans. Um, they typically live in the shallow areas of lakes among plants, logs, and decaying leaf litter. We don't usually see them actually because they're nocturnal predators. Um, however, um, there's many recordings and stories of biologists um, of leeches chasing our canoes and boats during the day. Um, I've actually experienced that and I know a few others that have as well. Um, so when you're getting your canoe and you have bunches of leeches sort of swimming after you, it's a little scary. Um, but the cool thing about leeches is that they actually are utilizing the medical field to prevent complications following different types of surgeries. So their saliva contains an anticoagulant that prevents blood, blood clots. Um, and leeches also release an anesthetic. So when they bite, it numbs the area. So at least if you do get bit by one, you won't feel it. And that, Amy, is it. So I'm gonna give up my control. All go. right, and I'm gonna see if I can take control. I feel like we should have given like a, I don't know, like a censorship rating or something on this so that we don't scare you all from going back into the lakes. I mean, this stuff is really cool and the chances of actually seeing this are fairly rare, but don't panic by some of this stuff. All right. So let's see, okay. 
So I know we're close on time and I have about eight slides and I'm going to try to do just shy of a minute per slide so we can leave a couple minutes for questions. Uh, so I'm going to focus on aquatic life that you're going to find attached to underwater surfaces. And I'm going to start with freshwater sponges. These are really cool. Uh, if you're out on the lake and you're looking down and you see a bright green splash of color from the bottom, it could potentially be a freshwater sponge. The sponge is an animal. And the reason why it's green, because we don't see a lot of green animals usually, is because it has a small green algae living within it. And that is, a, like um, Amanda mentioned, a symbiotic relationship where the sponge and the algae kind of work together and benefit each other. Um, and they sort of live in harmony, if you will. The uh, sponge benefits from the oxygen that the algae produces and the algae benefits from nutrients that are released by the sponge. So it's, it's a good little relationship there. Uh, you'll usually find these growing on rocks or wood that's underwater, uh, really commonly on underwater ledgy sections of lakes. Uh, and these can look like these fingers that are reaching up from the bottom. This is a good photo of somebody actually holding it. Or it could look like a, um, like a thin matter crust on top of a rock. So it really kind of is more uh, of a flat looking type of sponge. Now you're probably all thinking like the texture of a bath sponge or an ocean sponge uh, when you're thinking about these. And they have a little bit of a squish factor to them. But they also have this, it's a mild skeleton structure and it's because they have silica spines inside the, the matrix of the, the sponge. So it gives it sort of a skeleton structure. Um, freshwater sponges are filter feeders. They are indicators of good water quality. So they're very sensitive to water quality changes. So you're not likely going to have them in areas of poor water quality. Um, they are actually eaten by ducks and crayfish and many insects that are in the lakes. So they are a food source, which you might not think about. The next one is one that we get all the time and I see Andrea reacting and I'm sure you guys at New Hampshire Lakes hear about this all the time. Uh, bryozoans are sort of the creepy alien of the lake, I, I guess. They're harmless, they're kind of cool. Um, bryozoans, uh, the name bryozoan means this colony of animals. The individual animal, if you look at this upper right photo, you see all these little bumps. Each of those little bumps is an individual animal and the individual animal is called a zoid. And together they make the colony of a bryozoan. These are usually attached uh, to the ladders leading up to your docks or on your docks, so you encounter them often but you can also have them attached to sticks or ropes, uh, buoys, anything that's underwater or partially submerged, uh, tree branches, whatever. Uh, so they're typically tannish or brown in color or whitish. When they're starting to die at the end of the season, they could be clear. Um, a lot of people describe them as looking like brains. So we get the, I have a big brain in my lake, what is it? Um, and these things can be really variable. They can be a couple inches across. The biggest one that I've seen is actually as big as a basketball. So they get rather large. Um, the colony itself is almost a clonal colony of all these little zoids. And even though they're clones, these individual animals will specialize and some will take care of eating, some will take care of disposing of waste, some will take care of reproduction, so it's sort of this harmonious mass inside this jelly blob uh, that's working together um, in the lake. And they do filter feed a lot of algae out of the water column. So they could lead to clearer water. The next one is paraphyton. So Amanda covered a lot of the algae that are up in the water column and paraphyton are attached algae. So think about walking in the lake uh, or touching your dock or something that's been underwater for a while. And you feel that kind of slimy touch. Um, I've personally slipped and fallen on paraphyton on boat launches before and gone completely underwater uh, at very busy boat launches. 
Um, so they are slippery. Uh, you can see on the bottom left here, these rocks are covered in a slime. And then over on the bottom right, some of it is sometimes more tuft-like or hair-like coming off the rock. So it can be variable. Most of it's green algae. If it's a browner, slimier feel, it's probably a diatom, uh, which is another type of algae. These are really important in the food web. Uh, they're eaten by fish and insects, snails and crayfish. Uh, some of the things that you can use these for is if you don't have a lot of paraphyton in your lake, but there's a lot in one area, it could be an indicator that you have a nutrient source in that area, which is driving a lot of growth. So it may warrant further investigation as a result. Ah, uh, the egg masses. <laughs> there are lots and lots of eggs in lakes. Uh, we often get a lot of photos and samples of eggs. Um, we don't honestly know what all of them are. I think you need to be um, an insect expert to know what all of those eggs are. Um, but these are just some examples. Um, see, under the pond we leave here, these are all snail eggs. So if you've seen that, those are from different snails in the lake. Uh, Sarah showed this photo. Uh, damselflies will actually bore into the stems of some of the vegetation around lakes and lay their eggs in the stems. So you can look and see these little holes that are burrowed in there. Uh, up here is a giant water bug. This is the male. The female kindly deposits and actually glues her eggs all over his back and then bolts. She lays her eggs and leaves and goes and finds another guy and does the same thing. Um, so the male is responsible for brooding the egg. So if you see a bug that has a lot of eggs on its back, it's probably a giant water bug. Um, they also stick those to vegetation and the male sort of hangs out and guards those. And then uh, the yellow perch eggs. This was a mystery to us for a while. Uh, we had somebody send us a photo of this and we were unsure and had to do some research on this and it's sort of this clear accordion like look to the egg sac and you usually find it down on the bottom of the lake usually mixed in with some type of vegetation and then up here in the middle those are just different types of insect eggs on the bottom of lily pads most commonly. Uh, something that is less pleasant looking but actually quite harmless Iron bacteria. Iron bacteria are microscopic. So these little dark spots here uh, are actually iron bacteria. They're little bean shaped bacteria, but they produce a spiral stalk. And that stalk is what allows them to attach to surfaces. So they are attached to a degree and it keeps the, the bacteria kind of stationary. And that iron flock is formed. Um, so you all know plants do photosynthesis to gain energy using sunlight and carbon dioxide and nutrients. Um, iron bacteria use chemosynthesis. So they do like a chemical reaction using iron and oxygen in the water um, for energy and nutrients. So in that process, all of this flock material is released. So you guys might see in tributaries flowing into your lakes or along your lake shoreline area, this kind of gunky orange uh, accumulated material or flock. Uh, this can even occur in your wells and you can have kind of bad smelling well water on occasion. Um, it's not harmful, but it is unsightly and it's a taste and odor issue. Um, it does create this sheen. And a lot of times people think that it's an oil slick and an easy way to tell is the touch test. So if you see this red, orange, gunky stuff and you see an oily sheen, if you tap it with probably a stick is a good idea. Uh, if it shatters on the surface like broken glass, it's probably from iron bacteria. If it breaks apart and comes right back together um, seamlessly, it's probably a petroleum product. So that's one way to tell. Uh, a personal favorite, freshwater jellyfish. Um, it's a lucky day when I get to see a jellyfish because it happens once every couple of years uh, on the lakes that I work on. Most of the time, you're gonna see the medusa, the freshwater jellyfish that's up in the water column. You might see a mass of them like this. 
Um, if you've never seen a jellyfish, they're about the size of a quarter. They'd fit on your fingertip quite easily. But it's more the hidden side of jellyfish that we don't see. So we don't really know how many lakes that they occur in. Um, they were first seen in the United States in 1908. They are documented in more than 48 states. Uh, and lucky us, they are more prevalent in the Northeast. But most of the time, you would never see them. They exist in a polyp form that doesn't look anything like the Medusa. Uh, it's actually this little nondescript blob down on the bottom of the lake that are about two millimeters in size. So if you think of a penny, a penny is about a millimeter and a half in thickness. So they're a little bit taller than the width of a penny. So they're very small. And over time, they will start to grow taller. And then as they get more mature, they start to segment. And each of those segments is actually a medusa. And then eventually those medusa will break free and come up. So all while they're down here in this polyp phase, they're just going through um, asexual reproduction and just hanging out on the bottom. Um, and then something might trigger them, either water temperature or water chemistry. Um, or some type of genetic factor that makes them come up to the surface. And that's when they go through more of the sexual reproduction phase. And then they cycle back into a polyp eventually. So you may have jellyfish and never see them in the Medusa form. Um, there's really not a lot known about them, but they are really a cool creature to see. Uh, and don't worry, these tentacles do sting. But unless you are a copepod like Amanda talked about, or a tiny fish fry, you're safe. You're not even going to feel it through your layers of skin. And then just two more slides. Uh, native freshwater snails. I, most of you who know that I talk about invasive species, know that I talk about the Chinese mystery snail, which is an invasive. We actually have more than 26 species of native snails in our lakes and ponds. Um, they're tiny. Uh, if you look over here at the dime, that's about as big as they are in most cases. Uh, I see them a lot because I handle plants from lakes a lot and they're often mixed in with vegetation. Um, some of them are a little bit bigger, like the ram's horn or this one, which looks more like a nautilus. Um, so those are all native. Um, these over here are also native, but I do have to put a warning with this one. Uh, the the, per, this particular snail, it's actually commonly called a physid snail, is related to swimmer's itch. Um, so ducks that fly onto the lakes bring with them parasites in their gut. So when they defecate in our lakes, uh, they release the parasite and that parasite actually goes into this snail and has a life phase in the physid snail and it comes out as saccharia which is the secondary phase of the parasite. And that parasite is actually trying to get back into a duck, um, usually a mallard or a merganser, but sometimes it finds us. Um, and typically uh, it is a little picky. It likes blonde haired, blue eyed people mostly. Um, and it very easily burrows into people's skin and it can cause swimmer's itch, which is like a really itchy rash uh, if you've never had it. Uh, so this is really the only snail that's a problem. Uh, it's still native, but it, it does harbor this parasite cycle. And then my last slide um, doesn't really fall into the category with everything else, but I get asked this question enough that I just wanted to point it out. It's tubers, and they are sort of attached to the sediment. Um, you can see this is a big root system, and then this anchors it into the sediment. This is actually from a yellow water lily. And what happens is that um, gas bubbles or ice scour will pop these up and they'll float around in a lake. Um, this is actually one of my interns holding a uh, tuber. So you can see for scale, it's, it's pretty big. It's human sized, um, but they're harmless. But you might see them floating, especially in the spring months in the lake after ice out. Um, they might look fresh like this or <laughs> Uh, they might look kind of gross like this. Um, I came back from the field one day and this was on my desk with this lovely note that said, what is this? Um, and luckily I wasn't offended. I knew what it was. It was a decomposed yellow water lily tuber and I could tell by the, the shape of it. 
but um, yeah, uh, it is disturbing at times to see, but it is completely harmless and very common. Uh, moose actually will wallow into the shallows near shore and pop these up and eat them. Uh, they're full of carbohydrates and salt, and I always like to call them sort of like moose potato chips, if you will. So that is the conclusion of our uh, life in lakes for the evening. Uh, this is all of our contact information. If you'd like to reach out to one of us about something that we covered, and uh, that's our website so that you can visit us if you so choose. Wow, that was, thank you, Amy, Sarah, and Amanda. That was um, fun, fascinating, and, and a little scary too. Wow. Um, so, well, thank you. And for those of you, I, we're going right on eight o'clock. If you need to log off, um, feel free. Um, we will continue to record this and answer questions and you can and, um, view, view the Q&A um, at your leisure. But for those of you who, who are able to stay for a few minutes, please do. And I know we have a couple really good questions in the question uh, chat box. So I'm gonna turn it over to Crystal and Jessica to facilitate that. I'm actually still a little bit grossed out about the horse hair worms. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> I haven't quite recovered yet. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll start uh, with the early questions that we received. And no surprise, we have some really good questions about cyanobacteria, Amanda. Um, uh, the first question was, what really is our goal for cyanobacteria in our lakes? Um, we know that cyanobacteria are really everywhere, but are we trying to completely eliminate cyanobacteria or are we just trying to keep their populations in check? That's a good question. We're, we're really, we're not trying to get rid of cyanobacteria. Um, you know, they've been around for billions of years, actually helped us have oxygen on the planet now they're trying to kill us. No, they're, um, you know, they are sometimes toxic. What we really want people to know is, is just to be aware, just like if you were in a region where there were poisonous snakes, like you just want to be aware. It's not likely that you're going to drink the water at the beach, but dogs do. And that, I think that's something that people really need to be mindful of, even in the off season, walking by the lake, um, a shoreline scum might be toxic. Um, we are working on, on working with uh, watershed groups across the state on minimizing um, impacts that influence cyanobacteria bloom. So our approach is largely on controlling uh, the watershed issues, the runoff, um, just trying to implement those best management practices that you know New, New Hampshire Lakes promotes. Um, we do as well. So um, you know. New Hampshire DES is sort of starting to have the conversation about allowing permitting certain applications, but it it requires a lot of um, research and uh, understanding of the watershed itself, uh, the type of cyanobacteria that is a problem. Um, but I think overall, I, we just need to be aware of it and, and not be overly concerned, but it is a sign of eutrophication where our lakes are becoming more colored, um, becoming greener. Um, it's not just about the toxicity. Sometimes it's about the aesthetics. Um, we like clear lakes. We like clear water. Um, so again, it's, it's a watershed issue. There are tons of applications. If you Google search it, even on Amazon, you'll find like kill that blue green algae, this will work, but it's more complicated than that. And they are a part of the ecosystem. So we, we won't be getting rid of them completely, but we do wanna control them or prevent them from happening. And we have to work with each lake individually to address that. Great answer. Um, the second question that we had uh, for on the topic of cyanobacteria um, was in reference to heavy metals. And um, I have seen in passing some studies uh, about cyanobacteria um, being used for heavy metal remediation. But the question was specifically, um, what happens with cyanobacteria in a water body where there is heavy metal pollution? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, sometimes they co-occur, uh, and it's interesting. There's there's actually been a lot of correlation with more cyanobacteria and more mercury together. Um, you know, there's a, a delicate balance of other chemical and physical factors to consider, but um, certainly a lot of research is pointing to these other indicators that can help us understand why they're doing well or what they can do to benefit the lake system as well. Um, sometimes they um, provide a good source of beneficial bacteria, actually, because the beneficial bacteria come in and try to um, live with them. So there's, there is a lot of good things about cyanobacteria. They have chlorophyll. They're a good food source for some and not for others. Um, so you know, it's, it's really complicated, I would say, but the heavy metal question is really interesting. And, and I only know um, there's a few correlations of toxicity with um, iron development. Um, there's a lot of correlations with um, nutrients in the sediment and the chemical reaction that happens at the, at the um, interface of the sediment at the bottom of the lake and the water during anoxic conditions that then promote more nutrients. So there's, there's just a lot of different chemical aspects to the survival and success of cyanobacteria. Mm. Cool. Well, I have a personal question and then I'll, I'll throw it over to Jessica. Um, how do you feel about uh, the sort of like smoothie supplements that people are using these days? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's strange because um, we're saying don't even step foot in that water, but go, you know, have a smoothie. Drink uh, it. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, they're not all toxic. However, um, just in my time at UNH, we did test a few products and we did find some to be toxic. Um, there's even some that looked like someone just dumped a plankton net of organisms into the bottle and that was it. So there's a lot of things that are not regulated and they say they're healthy because they have chlorophyll, but you're really not getting the full picture of, of what's going on. I would say they, they have to be generally safe um, toxicity wise, but chronic exposure with cyanobacteria and their toxins is a real concern. Um, it, it might not immediately upset your stomach, but there's a lot of research that um, chronic exposure can cause um, like liver cancer a lot of digestive organ cancers, um, and even maybe neurological disease. Mm. So maybe pass off on the, uh, on the fancy smoothie supplements. <laughs> yeah, people are always like, Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I take it. It's great. And I'm like, yeah, I just, I, I wouldn't do it every day. I, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say. Yeah. It's hard to say, unless it's really, third party tested or something along those lines. <laughs> I will say there's a product called Bloom Foam that I'm really interested in. They're taking blue green uh, cyanobacteria blooms and creating foam to make shoes and other products with and um, I was like well that's a that's a good way to do it. Let's not let's step on it. Let's not drink it. Consume it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Amanda. Jessica do you want to uh, take it away? Sure. Um, we had someone asking, maybe talk about the good or the bad, or just your opinion on the aerators and the bubblers we see near the boathouses and docks in the winter and how that's impacting our critters. Amy, I feel like that's a question for you. How, yeah. how does that uh -huh. open ice affect maybe plant growth? The plant growth and insect life under under the water, I mean, you're certainly opening up the ice and you're going to have more sunlight penetration in those areas throughout the winter where you typically wouldn't when you have thicker ice cover close to shore. Um, so I do think that there are some impacts. I think that you may have um, some plants could persist under those conditions. Uh, some of them are very hardy and do persist as like an evergreen form through the winter. Um, but I do think it's a limited impact. Um, some lakes that are a little busier do tend to have more aerators around the shoreline, but by and large, most of our lakes typically don't. So I don't think it's a large impact. 
And I think that as long as their bubblers are not creating this huge open water space, as long as it's just big enough to keep the ice from forming around their docks or their boathouses, um, there is a valid claim to wanting to protect infrastructure onshore. Um, and you don't want that all ripping out, which could rip the bank out. So there's validity to it too. So I, I think that on the scale that we actually have it going on in New Hampshire lakes, it's really not a high impact. Cool, thank you. And Andrea, maybe you wanna comment on uh, safety with bubblers, but uh, I know that there are different things that we can do, like maybe putting them on a timer or a thermostat. What else can people do to reduce their impact with their bubblers? Yeah, I mean, you've nailed it on the head. Um, just as a sort of a, a public service announcement, if you do put it in bubblers, there are signs that you are required by law to post uh, so that people on the lake or going out into the lake can see um, from all sides, you know, I think it's a uh, thin ice um, so that they know that you are operating a bubbler. So. Very important. I would be very sad if I fell through a hole. <laughs> um, Sarah, we had a, uh, a couple of questions about leeches um, for you. One was regarding uh, indicator species and they were wondering if, um, you know, seeing a, a large population of leeches in a water body is any kind of indicator of water quality, or if not, what are some other species that are uh, really good indicators of, of water quality? Yeah, um, so leeches are generally, you know, they're moderately tolerant to pollution. Um, so they can survive in sort of lower oxygen level um, conditions, which you would typically find um, along the benthic zone anyway. Um, you know, you can find leeches pretty much anywhere, but it's really the composition of the aquatic insects or invertebrates that you can find. So if you have a, a system that's really dominated by leeches um, and you don't find a lot of insects that are more sensitive to pollution, so say mayflies or stoneflies, um, even dragonfly larvae that, you know, they all need really high levels of oxygen or, and are very sensitive to pollution. So if, you know, your environment is lacking those um, and dominated by leeches, um, I would say that it's you know, probably a good indicator of their a more polluted environment. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, the second question was regarding one of your, your slides um, with a, a sort of a light brown and a dark brown leech. Are those different types of leeches? Are they all the same leech just with, you know, different hairdos? Um, and if they're different, are they both from New Hampshire? I assume that they probably are. Well, that's a good question. Um, I can tell you that the leech picture that's on the rock, um, that is a native species from New Hampshire. Um, the other leech photo I grabbed from the dragonfly woman. Um, I don't think she's on the webinar, but I did send her the info. Um, and I, I just can't, I can't tell you if it's a native. It could be a northern bloodsucker, but I'm really I'm not the leech expert. Um, however, um, you know, you could certainly go on the Dragonfly Woman's um, blog and, and find that photo and see if it's it's native to um, New England environment. Do you right. think we have about a dozen or so species of different types of leeches in the state that are all native? Wow. I have one memory of getting covered in leeches as a kid that I won't share. <laughs> I'm sure it happens to everybody at some point when they're swimming. <laughs> um, Jessica, do you want to tackle the um, the question about uh, people's wells? I'm not sure um, if yeah. our presenters know this, but they're very <laughs> smart people, so maybe. They are smart. They were asking if iron bacteria can be eradicated from wells. I'll take that one. Um, so it is difficult, but it can they can be. Um, first, you need to make sure that you have a proper identification of what's in the well. Uh, we do have staff at DES that can look at water samples and determine if there are iron bacteria in the well. And it's a microscopic analysis to see if the bacteria in that stalk, that twisted stalk that I that I showed, is in fact in the well water. So if you call our public health labs, they can provide guidance on how to collect samples for that. 
Uh, and then, yeah, sometimes, um, depending on how bad the problem is, you might have to have your well scoured. So like a big scrubber brush, you know, up and down in the well head um, or the well casing to clean off the attached material. And then you might need to use bleach or acid or some other type of uh, a cleaner to, to kill off the bacteria and to break it down. Uh, and then of course you would have to flush your well a lot to get rid of all of that material that was in there, but it's possible. Um, it does take a little bit though. Hmm. Okay. Well, we have one other question that just came in. <laughs> um, uh, could you speak a little bit to Chinese mystery snails, Amy? You mentioned them earlier. Um, you know, how prevalent are Chinese mystery snails in, in New Hampshire's lakes? Yep, so Chinese mystery snails or um, Japanese mystery snails, they're, both, they're called both the same. Uh, they are large, probably about the size of a golf ball when they're mature. Uh, so you're, they're very obvious. They're not like the tiny little snails that I showed you. So if you have anything about that scale of size, it's a Chinese mystery snail. Um, they are in dozens of lakes across New Hampshire. We see more and more of them every year. Um, each mature adult can produce a few hundred to a thousand or 2000 young a year. So they are really prolific. Um, and they can be spread by transient gear between water bodies. So the clean, drain, dry message is very applicable to that species. Um, but yeah, I, I see them in more water bodies every year. I don't have an exact number of water bodies. I just know that it's dozens. It's probably upwards of 80 to 100 already in the state. Um, so far, we haven't seen any negative impacts from them other than the fact that they're large and they, became, they can become very numerous in the water bodies. But if you suspect that you might have them, feel free to take a picture of what you've got and put a coin or a ruler, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in the photo so that I have scale and I can identify it and, and show it with shell up and then the open side of the shell up so that I can get a, a look at all angles. Chinese mystery snails are so smelly. Thanks, Amy. Oh, they are smelly. <laughs> um, well, Jessica, did did we miss any? Did we get all the questions that came in I through the chat was, box? I think that was it. Yeah. Okay. Well, awesome. Nice job, everyone. Um, I want to thank um, everyone for spending the evening with us. That, again, was truly fascinating. And I encourage you when the ice is out to get out there and explore the shore and, and the, the shallows and, you know, jump overboard and put that, the, you know, scuba mask on and see what you can see. And if you find anything strange, we've got, you now know the experts that you can um, send your photos and share your stories with. Um, and then we'll have to have you guys back next year and you can tell us all the, the crazy interesting things that people reported to you over the past year. So um, thank you all uh, again for tuning in. And again, um, tomorrow, everyone, you'll receive an email from me uh, with links to this presentation. Um, and you'll also receive a um, evaluation. Again, let us know how we did and other things you guys want to learn about. So. I think we'll we'll wrap it up for the night. Um, everyone, thanks again. Be well, stay safe, and I hope to see you uh, next month. Uh, Crystal and I and Jessica will be bringing a Lakes in Spring uh, webinar to you. So um, four weeks from now, it should be a little bit more springy out there. So uh, have a great month. Thank you, everyone.